talking about uh, fellowships, especially spine fellowships, is a very uh, closely liked topic of mine. Uh, I've been doing that since uh, I've been coming back. Uh, it's an immense honor to be able to follow uh, in steps with my mentor on the same stage. And this talk would be a testament to the fact that uh, it's not just a personal growth, it's the, the, the journey that happens. It happens in the steps of your uh, mentor. In, it's an immense pleasure to be here on the day of Guru Purnima, sharing the stage with Sir, and uh, I hope this talk does justice to everything that you've taught. So, uh, we're going to run through uh, fellowship opportunities. We're not going to talk about what spine surgery is. So, spine surgery has been there since ages. Hippocrates descri described it. First, lumbar laminectomy was done in 1829 and since then we have significantly evolved. We've come to modern techniques. Everybody now looks at how small the incisions are, what endoscopy is, what tubes are, what minimally invasive surgery is. We've even come to modern technology. You know, we have the OAM, the robot, the navigation. And training should be something which incorporates all of that into your armamentarium of working. So the any 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 place you work at or any place you train at would need to imbibe every facet of spine surgery into your skill set. So now before we go on to fellowship, we need to understand, I think sir has adequately speak, spoken of what the Indian scenario is or what the way of work here is. So it's we have a highly specialized spinal care. What we mean by highly specialized is we have access to specialty spine surgeons and now super specialized spine surgeons who predict you who work in finer nuances of different types of spine surgery our care is very patient centric and this is something we realize after we have experience overseas where the care is actually institute centric or financial centric where decisions are made based on the cost factor rather than the patient factor we have a huge impetus for minimally invasive approaches, endoscopy, and that is something which is coming up with age. And that is important because that is a skill set which the which you should have and which the patient would expect you to have. That's the question that they ask or ki, sir, bina take ka surgery hoga kya? So that those things come up only when you have that exposure in the time of your training. We have routine use of neuromonitoring navigation and limited to certain centers, but it's upcoming. Uh, we have a most important factor is that we have a very large volume of work. As, as it was rightly said, there is no dearth of work for anybody who starts practice in our country. And that just makes it a point that once we start working, it's very difficult to step back to go back into training because work's going to flow ahead. You will not like to take a step back. And skull to sacrum, we have a wide range of pathologies of patients who will come to you. So it's equally important for you to know how to treat that patient who comes to you either with a CV junction anomaly or with a circle tumor. So that's where your fellowship experience, especially when it comes to spine surgery, comes in very handy. Now, I have these five pillars for any fellowship training. Patient numbers, meaning you need to have enough work. Second, hands-on training, which I feel is a smaller part of the bigger picture. Academic appreciation, you need to have involvement in academics and access to technology equipment research advances. So now if I extrapolate that to spine surgery, we need those two facets which are very important where exposure to technology and equipment, where you have your OAM robot and you have research advances meaning endoscopy, minimal invasive techniques, anterior surgeries because that's something which used to be a lost start and we are now coming back to it. It's, it we come down the whole circle where there are researchers of anterior approaches. So all of these need to be incorporated into your planning of where you do your the fellowship at. So what should be the aim of your spine fellowship? Unfortunately, we come to a stage where it a fellowship is judged by the amount of hands-on cutting that we get, which I, in my opinion is the last thing that you should consider when you apply for a fellowship. It should be, I mean, when it comes to spine surgery, the biggest challenge or biggest learning lesson is the decision making. Two years I had the ASSI fellowship with the, uh, Sir at Hinduja and the one big lesson I learned was the OPD is the time where I learn the most. It's not the operative theatre because that's when I know when not to operate and when to operate and even when to operate what sort of surgery to do not every patient is a tlif so decision making analyzing mri scans interpreting those images looking at those that subtle elevation of crp or a white cell count that is what your training should imbibe and not just the 
surgical skill development of course surgical skill development is important but it won't matter if your decision at the outset is not right so it should have these different facets which will make you a complete surgeon at the end of your fellowship chronology is very important so in my early fellowship days there was a lecture uh, dr vt ingalrikar and it was something uh, on the lines of how a fellowship should be and he said that the fellowship should run in a particular chronology you should need to know how to do a open surgery first then move on to doing mis and endoscopic surgeries and then finally get in the assistive technology you can't skip a step because if at any stage the one of you run into an issue or a complication with any of the later steps your fallback is going to be completely opening the spine identifying your landmarks and then putting your particle screw in so unless you know your open techniques your knowledge of endoscopy or robotics will not come in that handy when that situation is challenging so when we start looking at the fellowships whom to turn to we and this is an absolutely fantastic forum uh, and i i congratulate the team because we this is the second year we are doing it and it's it's a fantastic uh, opportunity to get an idea to of what the options are out there and to connect peer to peer with all the people who have been through the journey so that helps you find the right footstep going ahead so now coming to the spine part of it itself so there are particular hot hubs that we call for spinal training number one is always going to be india and it i'll come to that as well sir has adequately mentioned it but it's the same principle that india will be my first choice other centers are there and we'll come to them uh, as we go through we can broadly divide them into long term and short term so long term are the one where you will expect to stay at least one to two years because those are the ones where you really spend time build your rapport with your mentor and eventually start doing work on your own both seeing patients making decisions and operative so that's where your long term fellowship is sort of invaluable in the whole training process short term ones have their particular advantages especially when it comes to smaller niche skills where which are not broadly available where you don't probably need to spend a very long term time so coming to india we have two types of fellowships one are societal fellowships like fellowship from the fnb from the assi and then there are direct mentorships where you don't necessarily go through a, a interview process but you directly approach your mentor and ask them what we call as private fellows so which are directly working with the mentor itself both eventually take you to the same mentor so it's not a difference in terms of choice the only difference is that with the societal fellowship you get a certification which comes through from a recognized body the biggest advantage that we have in terms of spinal training in india is the academic appreciation there is massive amount of educational activity which goes on from all the societies so from bombay orthopedic society bss assi we have conferences and events probably happening every weekend along with specific fellowship fellow training courses which the bss runs so the amount of exposure that you get and trust me this is going to be this is much less when you go overseas and much more expensive when you go overseas to attend these courses so we sometimes undervalue what we have till we see the other side so the academic appreciation that we have is immensely huge when we are practicing or when we are learning in our own country adaptation to local population care or local flora fauna that we call is something which is uh, important if you are planning to do a private practice in mumbai or in india as such because that gives you an idea of how to interact and how to balance the practice managing the patient expectations versus what the ideal treatment for that patient is i word ideal actually is very subjective because there is no ideal treatment when it comes to balancing patient expectation but it's something which comes with understanding the mindset and way of communicating things with the patients and these are the nuances that help eventually in the longer run in private practice which you know or which you learn by seeing your mentors do it it's it's a skill which is acquired only by seeing it it can't be taught so uh, moving overseas uk is a fantastic place uh, to learn spine surgery because the nhs essentially is a government hospital so where the by vicarious responsibility the if anything happens it's not your responsibility technically is a department responsibility so it's a good place to learn every fine skill there is to learn uh, spine surgery at 
there are centers where like i was in nottingham so nottingham had eight consultants all eight of them were doing different things so there was one consultant who would only do cervical spine surgery one would do only navigated fusions two would do only pediatric spine surgery one would do adult deformity and we would rotate six months with each so over the time that you spend there you would end up getting exposure to all of these and know what you like what you want to do and what you don't believe in like over my time of six months doing adult deformity i realized that i don't like the adult deformity it's it's complete hokum so i don't practice it myself but it's something that unless you see it you will not know whether you right. believe it or not pathway wise i think we'll cover that when we come to uk but there are mrcs and non mrcs pathways i personally went through the non mrcs pathway which is also giving you the same opportunity as the mrcs one but with limited options of which centers to apply at the biggest advantage in the uk is that you there are certain select fellowships which are uh, royal college accredited meaning at the end of the fellowship you get a you have a proper convocation in the royal college at london and you get a certificate which goes which comes from the royal college of england so that adds certain value to the fellowship and the cv and most importantly all applications are centralized so it's a very easy application you don't need to run from post to pillar to find where to apply all you need is to go on to nhs jobs or track jobs register on a, there is a email alert so if you put spine fellowship in the keyword and register as a email alert every time a new fellowship job opening comes up you'll get an email so it makes your job of finding the fellowship much more easier and all applications are saved so your previous application you applied somewhere else can be copy pasted to the next uh, uh, application as well canada australia singapore they broadly have a similar pattern there is no centralized application you need to go through each individual institute I, this list is not exhaustive but these are the most important institutes all of them have a direct application the application criteria is pretty much similar where you need to have certain basic documents you need to directly apply and but it needs to be done individually to each unit to be able to be considered for the fellowship coming to smaller centers korea is an endoscopy hub so if for somebody who wants to train up in the finer skill of endoscopy that will be the place to go germany actually has a very fantastic opportunity for training but the biggest barrier is language like i spent a month in munich i wanted to leave after two weeks because even their morning mdd used to be in german although it mentions on paper that it it something it's a discussion going to happen in english but it happens in german uh usa the biggest challenge is for a long term fellowship you need to have the us assembly you need to be uh, going through the sf match so unless you've done that in the previous years take, taking those steps for me is probably a bit too much of a stretch you can go there for a shorter fellowship or a small societal fellowships hong kong is a good place for more complex work complex cervical spine surgery complex deformities but probably something to aim only for a shorter time now application caveats are very important and this is one of the most important points i will stress on it there is at least a 2 to 3 year lead period leading up to the time you start your fellowship if you are finishing ms now you will probably end up with a long term fellowship in not earlier than 2 to 3 years so that's how early you need to plan and start planning means start applying for or start researching where you want to go and start the application process build up your cv publication presentations everybody is going to mention that i am not going to focus that and eventually it's going to come down to your cv and your references moving to societal fellowships so we have the fellowship from the assi which is like for me is the benchmark of what the indian training is it's a two year structured fellowship it's very comprehensive because the centers that offer the fellowships have a immense amount of spinal work again skull to sacrum work so you get exposure to everything and the mentors are fantastic Uh, this is a last year's uh, asi brochure but this year we have added a couple of more centers as well but usual deadline for application is around june to july the biggest advantage is there is an exit exam and a thesis so it makes the course more comprehensive it gives you that impetus to study uh, because there is going to be an exam at the end and the thesis makes it more research oriented because you know you're going to have that mindset that there is a research which goes on the mentors are exceptional there is no question of that and it gives you that uh, indian experience as well AO spine has multiple centers different types of fellowship short term long term depends on what you want to go but the mandatory criteria is you need to be an AO member and you need to have the done the at least one the AO basic spine course to be able to be considered and the order is you need to do the national first before you can go for an international one lots of centers AO the website gives lots of information you can check it out and i think the the usual date for application is around september 
SRS is a particular niche for somebody who wants to have some exposure deformities. There are lots of opportunities there. All of them are usually short term, so four to six weeks. And I think four to six weeks for a deformity centric fellowship is more than enough. There is a particular educational grant that they have called the last one which I mentioned, Global Outreach Program. That is something which I would highlight on because that gives you the funding to be able to attend the SRS annual meeting uh, or the IMAST for fully funded. So that is something which all of you should apply for and actually the application process is online and quite simple. The other, the other institutes also have the similar principles, SICOT, APSS, IOA, IASA, all of them individually can be researched but it's pro broadly on the same principles. For me, observerships is a very niche uh, field. Uh, I would like to say it's not uh, learning the same thing from one person, it's learning the same thing from different persons. Which, because eventually it is you who has to make your mindset of how you want to practice or how, what you want to do to your patients. So observership gives you that ability to have a wider audience without needing to spend more time there. And the second biggest advantage is there are certain skills which we won't want to spend long time on. So it helps you get that fine tuning in your pra practice, get that finesse and the finer skills after you finished your broader training. So observership does have a vital role, but you need to time it perfectly of when you want to go and where you want to go. Now, this is my journey since I finished and over the past eight years, through finished, I am going through a short observation. Recording started. Hong Kong. After which I did my ASSI fellowship in Hinduja with sir. Then two short Abhishek. fellowships, one in uh, one SRS fellowship with Dr. Recording Kevin. Recording Kevin. One fellowship. Then eventually Charlie. ended up in the fellowship. Then an associate consultant and a locum consultant. Of course, being does matter. Covid hit, which made one of the consultants leave, which gave me an opportunity to become a consultant there. But you will not get the luck factor if you're not there. So it, it's the taking that first step is most important and taking that first step as soon as you can is most important. So if there are some take home points from that journey, most important is define your goal, what you want from your fellowship and what you want your end point to be, because that's how you can't start blind. You have to have a goal at the end where you want to be at the end of your training and Accordingly, start shortlisting your centers because researching your centers and reaching out to the colleagues, colleagues, and eventually even the the fellowship directors. Because un unless what we, we directly have a direct reference, you will not be able to push through. Plan ahead. Keep a value of time. Two to three years is the lead period, so that has to be pushed through as early as you can. Robust application is very key. We'll come to application uh, talk as well. And in Indian training. <laughs> It comes to a to build everything else. Thank you.